The next foundational view topic we want to take a look at is computed properties. Computed properties allow us to compose new data derived from other data. And I have a classic example of this down here where imagine within an application, we had data properties for a user's first name and last name. And frequently throughout the application, we want to output their name somewhere on the page, but we want to combine the first name and last name together so we get their full name. To accomplish this, we can create a computed property, which you can see here, we're just going to set this within a computed option within our application. And the computer property, it's just a function we're going to add within here. And within this function, we're going to return some value. And in this case, the value we're returning is just a combination of our first name and last name data properties uh, separated with a space in between. All right, so pretty straightforward in terms of functions. We're just accessing existing data within this um, particular application. But what makes this interesting is anytime first name or last name is updated within our application, this computed property will be re-invoked. We will get a refreshed value from it. Let's quickly see this in action. So I'm just going to copy this directly from the notes. I'm going to bring in the computed option. I'll add it after my data, before my methods. And then I will just uh, initialize first name and last name as data properties. And then in my template, I'll throw in a couple inputs where we can enter a first name and last name. And then we're going to text interpolate or output an invocation of our full name computed property. And this is temporary, so I'll just add it at the very end. And let's enter a first name and a last name. And you can see our full name computer property is reactively updating as we're making uh, changes to these values. Now, the same effect could be created using regular methods as well. And just to simulate this, let's add another method. We'll call this one get full name. And we'll have this return the same thing that our full name computer property is returning, which is a combination of first name and last name. And then we will also output this to the page. All right, so we can see both of our outputs. This is from our computed property, and this is from our method. So the end result is the same, but let's imagine that we needed to do this in multiple places throughout our application. And just right now, hypothetically, I'll, I'll simulate that. So I will output the full name computer property three times, and then I will output the method version get full name three times as well. In this situation, the computed property is going to be more optimal because behind the scenes, the data we get back from our computer properties is cached. So the very first time we invoke it, it's going to have to uh, concatenate together first name and last name, give us the value, but then it's going to cache the results. So the next time we invoke it, we're just going to get that cached version and then the same thing for the third time. Now, to the extent that first name or last name is updated, that will cause the full name computer property to re-evaluate. Uh, but again, it's only going to do it for the first time and then use the cached results for any subsequent uh, uses of it. Now, the same cannot be said for methods. Uh, for each invocation of this method, it is going to have to fetch the data for first name and last name, join it together, give us the results. It'll do it again for the second time and again for the third time. It's not taking advantage of any sort of caching system. Now, in a basic example like this, you're not going to like notice a performance difference between these two techniques. But of course, we want to think about our application growing more complex, scaling up. A lot more things are going to be happening in the interface. Uh, perhaps more complicated things are happening within these functions. Um, that's where the caching system and the optimization that Vue provides with computer properties can start to come into play. For another example and use case of computer properties, uh, I actually want to jump back uh, earlier in this series. Uh, it was in part five. We were talking about list rendering. And one of the things we were trying to accomplish there was to render a filtered list of items uh, by combining a vif inside of a v4. And actually, let's follow this link so we can refresh our memories on what we were doing. So we had a uh, array of Spanish words, and we were trying to just output the uh, words that met some length criteria. For example, uh, here we have it where we only want to output words that are less than or equal to three characters long. So the way we accomplish this is we started with a v4 directive to iterate through our list of words. And then within there, we had an element that we were going to conditionally display if the given word we were looking at matched our criteria. In other words, if that word, if the length was less than or equal to three characters. 
All right, so that worked, um, and uh, we saw how to do that. We saw, right, that we wanted to nest the V if with inside some V4. If we didn't do that, we ran into like a precedence issue. Um, but at the time, I mentioned that the better approach to doing something like this was to use computer properties. And hopefully that makes sense now because as we saw, the idea with computer properties is to derive new data based on your existing data properties. And that's what we're doing here. We want to come up with a list of filtered words based on our Spanish words data property. Uh, let's put this together. Let's see this in action via computer properties. So the first thing I'm going to do uh, is bring back my Spanish words array as one of my data properties. And then I'll set up a computer property. Let's call it short Spanish words. And what this needs to do is it needs to return a version of our Spanish words data property where uh, we filtered it down to just the words that are less than three characters. Uh, and the way I'm going to do that, I'm just going to use JavaScript's built-in uh, filter method. So we'll say this Spanish words dot filter. And then the argument we're going to give it is a function that's going to act as the test as to whether each element, or in this case, each word, should be included in our filtered results. And of course, our criteria here is just whether the word is less than or equal to three characters in length. All right, so with that defined, let's uh, now iterate through this computed property and output the results. So I'll go back to my template and I'll set up a unordered list. Within there, I will use a list item and our V4 directive to iterate through our short Spanish words computed property. And let's go ahead and see what this gives us. And perfect, we've got uno and dos. Uh, looking back at our list of words, those were the two words that were three characters or less. And then of course, because it is a computed property, if we had something in this application that was say altering this array, we would see that this would be kept up to date so that anywhere we were invoking this computed property, we would get refreshed results whenever Spanish words uh, was altered. Uh, now moving on, a feature that's somewhat similar to computed properties is something called watchers. Watchers allow us to define functions that are going to be watching for a change to a particular data property. And when that change occurs, we can trigger something to happen. As an example of this, let's go back to our first name and last name example, and let's rewrite the functionality of combining those two things together. But instead of using a computed property for that, or even a method, we're going to use a watcher for it. And to facilitate this, the first thing I'm going to do is actually add a new data property that is going to uh, hold the full name together. And we're going to see how we're going to set up watchers to update that. So after first name and last name, let's create a new data property called full name, which will initialize to an empty string. All right. And then down here, I'm going to add a new watch option. So I'll add it after computed, but before methods. And then I could define my watchers in here. And my watchers are just going to be functions, and I want to name them after the data property I want to watch. So to begin with, let's focus in on the first name data property. So I'll create a function called first name. And what I want to do is define what should happen whenever first name changes. And what I want to happen is I want to, to basically update this full name data property. So what I'll do is I'll reference that, this full name. And I want it to be a combination of first name and last name, just like we did in the computer property. So I'm actually just going to copy this from up here, like so. All right, so that should update full name whenever first name changes. And we want to do the same thing for the last name. Anytime last name changes, we also want to update full name. So let's copy this existing watcher. We'll name the second one last name. That's the data property we're going to be watching. And I don't have to change anything in the body of the function because the same thing needs to happen when uh, last name changes. All right, so now to see the output of this, what I'm going to output is not the watchers themselves. I'm going to output full name, and I'm just going to rely on the watchers behind the scenes to update full name for me whenever first name or last name changes. So coming back to our template here, we'll do another output, and we'll say hello, and we'll just reference the full name data property. Uh, we don't need multiples here. I was talking about caching earlier. That's why I had multiples, but we don't need that. Uh, basically, we just have our three different variations of how we're getting the first name and last name combined together. The first was with a computed property. 
The second was with a method, and now we're seeing an example where we're taking advantage of watchers. Uh, but regardless of the technique, the output should be the same. So let's make sure that's the case. And I'll go ahead and enter our first name and last name again. All right, you can see we're getting the same results. We are also getting a warning in the console though that our computer property full name is already defined in data. Uh, and to understand what's going on there, let's go back to the JavaScript. Uh, this was my mistake. So I created this full name data property, but we already had a computed property called full name and we can't have duplicate names there uh, because when we're referencing it in things like our template, our application doesn't know, are you talking about the computed property here or the data property? There's no way of distinguishing it. So we wanna be on the lookout for that. Um, and the way I can address this, let's just say, I'll just rename it up here to first name and last name. And then I'll just update my watchers, making sure that that is the value it's actually updating. And then of course, in our template, we'll wanna update it here as well. All right, that should work the same. Let's make sure I'm gonna refresh it, make sure I don't have any wardings. And it looks like everything's uh, working as expected. All right, and with that, that gives us three different approaches to solving the same problem. And in terms of comparing these approaches, we've already talked about how in this situation, a computed property is more ideal than a method because we get the advantages of caching. Um, I would also say that the computed property approach is better than the watcher just because uh, the watch approach is more verbose. It took two separate functions to accomplish the same thing. And then within those functions, we had duplicate code uh, to construct the first name and last name. So that, that from a coding perspective, that's obviously not um, ideal. Um, that being said, there are use cases for where watchers would be ideal. And uh, to speak to this, let's actually go back to the notes. At the very end, we have a breakdown Kind of a summary that talks about methods versus computer properties versus watchers and when you would use which approach um, and as i mentioned earlier with methods these are most commonly used when you're reacting to some event happening right you're clicking a button you're entering a key you want to trigger something to happen method is going to be the go-to approach there computer properties are ideal in those situations where you're composing new data or some variation on existing data uh, especially if you want it to be reactive, right? If you're expecting the dependent data to be changing, you want to regenerate your composed data, computer properties are the tool to reach for. All right, and finally with watchers, uh, a use case for where watchers would be ideal is if you want some action to occur in response to a data property changing, that's where watchers are good. Um, and we'll actually see an example of this in the next video where we're gonna really start to put together the Flash Word application. And one of the things we're gonna do is once the user gets all of the words correct, we wanna display like a global success message. And we'll accomplish that via a watcher because we're gonna set up a watcher that's gonna look at a data property that's gonna keep track of how many correct answers we have. And once that number passes a certain point, then we'll display our global success message. All right, and that, that's a good use case for a watcher. So in summary, we've got several tools within view that uh, often seem to have like overlapping purposes, uh, but they definitely have different situations where they're gonna excel. And this is something that as we continue through the series and we see more examples of these, um, I think you'll, you'll start to get a better sense of when you should be reaching for which tool. Uh, but like I just said, uh, in the next video, uh, we're going to take a break from learning new view things. And what we're going to do is we're going to apply all of the tools we've been working with up to this point and really start to flesh out the details of our FlashWord application.